We're going to turn uh, now to uh, our third commandment, Exodus chapter 20. If you don't know where the Ten Commandments are, it's in Exodus 20. And we're going to read um, uh, just uh, one verse this morning. But before we read the third commandment, can I just encourage you about our commandments? That the commandments of God are not a drag that we can be really glad to get rid of and forget of. Actually, we've declared this is living a life of freedom. The commandments show us how to live in freedom, and Jesus Christ, of course, comes into our life and gives us the power to live in that freedom. 1 John 5 verse 3 says, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commandments. And Jesus said the same thing, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. So we want to know his commandments, we want to step into them, and we want the power to be able to understand them, and then, of course, to do them. And the next phrase says, and his commands are not burdensome, which means his commands are not a drag, quite the opposite. His commandments are a life of freedom. So we're going to look at one area of our life today, and you're going to see it's really relevant to how we live, not just on a Sunday, but every day of our lives. Very often, actually, what we did in those six days often spills out on this seventh day. And so it's important we get the seventh day right, but we want every day uh, to be focused on the honor of God's name. So here comes the third commandment. Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. And I want to give a, a paraphrase, paraphrase is the wrong word to use, another translation, a much older translation of the same verse, as it's a really short reading, just verse, one verse. Let's look at it in another version from the King James. Thou shalt not, serious sort of a feel there, isn't there? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And all God's people said, Amen. So yes, this is a short but powerful reading today, and our theme is very simple. It's the name of the Lord, and wasn't our worship this morning like a sermon in itself about the power that there is in his name? One commentator, Douglas Stewart, says this means speak Yahweh's name respectfully and honestly. This is about the honor and even the dishonor of God's name and the person who is behind that name, and then we will realize that there's power in the name of Jesus. If you know there's power in his name, would you give God praise, everybody? It is a strange, it's a strange mystery that people will take the name of God and the name of Jesus in vain. I don't, why, don't know why people don't say, oh, Confucius, or why they don't say, oh, Buddha, but they will use the name of Jesus, perhaps because people know there is power in the name, and mankind, naturally, we are rebels against God. Mankind is in rebellion against God, so we should expect many people to attack the name of God. But I want to declare that God is one, that God exists. He is Almighty God. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, and there is something about His name. There's power in His name. I got in my notes that I was going to refer to my own name this morning, Reese, spelt R-H-Y-S. And I walked into the South Campus, we had a bunch of visitors, and uh, Shelley, who's our uh, uh, preschool minister at the South Campus, goes, Pastor Reese, she says, this young man is also called Reese, and he spells it R-H-Y-S, which is, yes, the proper way. And so th we got excited, so I high-fived him, so, so from now on, I'm sure I'm going to say, hey, Reese, and he's going to say, hi, Reese. And I get to do this a lot more in Wales, of course, where they always spell it R-H-Y-S. You know, Reese is the old name of a warrior prince who came to the throne when he was four years, four years old, and he renounced the power of his throne so he could set the people free and lead them spiritually. And so, yeah, I'm excited about my name. It means passion. It means enthusiasm. And when I'm in Wales, I often meet people called Reese. In fact, there's a lot of our Wales rugby team are called Reese. So five times I've introduced myself to different players and said, hi, Reese, I'm Reese." And there's a bond, there's a connection when you say your name. And I hope it when you hear the sound of your name, I hope that encourages you. It's a good thing for us to remember each other's names and speak those names. But we also know that sometimes those other names can hurt us. 
those people that said to us, you're no good, or you're a pain, those harsh things that people say, cyberbullying is increasingly an issue in our culture, and we stand against that in the name of Jesus, amen? People are not to be torn down, but to be lifted up and encouraging. Now, sometimes we can be touchy about our name. Uh, I put uh, someone's name in a book once, and uh, I showed it to, to them, and I thought they'd be encouraged. They went, spelt it wrong. I was like, okay, sorry. And so we can get touchy. <laughs> we, I'm, I thought I was encouraging them. We can get touchy about our name. We can get touchy about our family name. And we can even sometimes get touchy about our college football team name as well. But what should really affect us more than anything, when God's name is disrespected, something welled up within the prophets, something welled up within the Son of God when he saw that the Father's house was not being treated right, and he got those whips, and he drove out those animals, and he turned over the table, zeal for your house consumes me, Jesus was quoted as saying, passion for your house, God, for the name of God burns within me. And so God has revealed his name to Moses in the same Bible book of Exodus. And when Moses hears the holy, revered name of God, he takes off his shoes and he realizes that he's in holy ground and he needs to humble himself before Almighty God. We've sung of the awesome, holy, powerful name of God today, amen. And so in the new covenant, how much more because we have God the Son with us by the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we address Abba, our Father, how much more should we be aware of the powerful presence of God today? You know, in the Old Testament times, the high priest could only speak the name of God once per year in the Holy of Holies. So revered was the name of God that people took great care over his name. Now, there are other names that are used in the Psalms, uh, and throughout Scripture that we can celebrate, he's the King of kings, he's the mighty one, El Shaddai, the God of angel armies, Jehovah Jireh, the Rose of Sharon, Deliverer, Healer. Is there any name greater than Jesus? We say no. But then there are other names that we don't accept. We don't accept Mother Nature is not God. The man upstairs is not a name worthy of God. May your God go with you is not a creed of the church, and we don't have the luck of the gods. People use those phrases often, but we must, above all, get a vision this morning of the honor of God's name. And I hope that we can leave this place with great delight in our hearts that he is truly worthy. We like to have a backdrop to our message. Ten is, of course, our series about the Ten Commandments. But if I had a backdrop for the day, I would say it's that God is holy. If you want to understand the holiness of God's name, you understand that his character is holy and we should honor and revere his name. And to offend the holiness of God is a terrible thing. In fact, that's the gospel in a nutshell. God is holy. We are not holy. So he sent his holy son who never sinned to die on the cross for us, to give us his righteousness. Jesus became God forsaken that we need never be forsaken so that we could be right with God and receive his holiness today. Have you received his holiness? Have you received his forgiveness and his grace? You can receive it, my friend, today. So God is holy. Let me tell you a story. One day the Israelites were guiding the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. And that in itself sounds pretty precarious, and if you know the Bible story, they weren't supposed to actually do that. That very holy thing where the presence of God was most manifested on earth was supposed to be carried by a bunch of people with long poles that went through the loops in the Ark of the Covenant. They were supposed to carry it, and no doubt they would rotate the priests that would carry it so, they, so nothing could ever happen to the Ark. And if one stumbled, they could all hold it and they'd be safe. So you know something's going wrong when the people of God were leading the Ark of the Covenant on a cart led by oxen. Doesn't that sound a little bit precarious? Doesn't that sound actually a little bit redneck, if I may say so? I mean, it's like, hey, Baba, let's get our Ford F-150, get a train, and we're putting the Ark of the Covenant on the back. <laughs> Come on, I've been living here for 14 years, people. Thank you so much. And so they, they knew it was holy, they knew it was important, they knew there was a job to be done, but they weren't doing it God's way. And they weren't rightly revering and recognizing that within the Ark of the Covenant are the tablets of the Ten Commandments and that jar with some manna left in it. And uh, above all, the glorious holy presence of God so that one day 
the very Shekinah glory of God will be manifest around that ark in the temple. And so one of the oxen starts to uh, stumble. And then we read the scripture here. We've got it on the screen. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, you can see the accurate historical account here. Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God, which nobody was allowed to do, because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent, everyone say irreverent, irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. We're supposed to feel shock over that. It reminds us of when with Ananias and Sapphira, when they sinned, they were both struck down dead before the people of God in God's presence. So what do we learn from that? What do we learn, everybody? God is holy. God is holy. And we're called to revere him and honor him. He's not too holy to get close to, but we can get close to him through the person of Jesus Christ, his son. And when we realize our unholiness, we run to Jesus and we say, God, forgive me, cleanse me. And we can do that every day. We can do that every hour. In fact, sometimes don't we need to do it every hour? Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And that's just driving through Atlanta, isn't it? But I mean, wherever we are, Wherever we are, we, we can come running back to him. That's the joy of the new covenant, that we can know a holy God and his righteousness. Now, I heard someone say this. Sin is not a bad habit that we slipped into that we can undo by good habits. Can I say that again? Sin is not. Sin is not. Though it includes bad habits, sin is not a bad habit that we slipped into that we can undo through good habits. Sin is the way that we were born. We can all actually declare, I was born this way. We were sinful by birth, and the only way that our nature can be changed is not by a change of habit. The only way our nature can be changed is by having a new nature, the personality of Jesus Christ living within us, cleansing us, washing us clean, so that we are resurrected. We are made alive. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We don't overcome sin by good habits. We overcome sin by receiving what Christ has done for us on the cross. Say hallelujah. And so... I'm covered over with a robe of righteousness that Jesus Christ has given to me. I didn't deserve it, but through his cross, I can have this new personality in Jesus Christ. We need the shed blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to make us holy. So when the world says, I was born this way, I would say, yes, I was born that way too, but I'm repenting of my sin. And I need forgiveness and I need grace. The world says, no, let me celebrate this as my identity. But the Christian says, no, I have a new identity. It's in Jesus Christ, all received by his grace. Will you receive the identity of Jesus Christ? And then Christian ethics is how we live out of that. It's how we recognize the power of God within us through Jesus we're living out in the new birth. We're living out a resurrected life. We have the word of God. We have the spirit of God with us today. God is holy and we can know him and praise him. I want to praise the holy God sometime a little bit more, don't you? Would you give him some more praise? Lord, you're holy. We can know you. We thank you, Lord God. Don't try and overcome sin by, by a couple of little good habits. Overcome sin through the full-blown power that there is in Jesus Christ. So secondly, this is really important for us to understand. God is holy and God's name is holy. God's name is holy. So why is this like the third commandment? Is it just like um, you know, a little, little shift in our vocabulary? Is that what the Ten Commandments ask for us? Not at all. It's about being utterly aware of the greatness of God, being utterly aware of the holiness of God, and then all our life adapting to his life. Psalm 8 verse 1 says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set the glory in the heavens. Psalm 34, 3, glorify the Lord with me. We sing this one at church, don't we? Let us exalt his name together. Read this psalm with me, everyone. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. That's the heart of the third commandment. We give glory. We give honor. All of our life is to do with the honor of God. And when there's dishonor in our life, so we repent and ask God to wash us clean. And he's going to do some work in our hearts today. He's going to do some work at this altar as well. So I've got some examples now of how we can break the third commandment. Let's understand it and let's get victory this morning. Can I have an amen? Here's the first thing, using God's name disrespectfully. 
If there's anything doubtful about the way that we speak about God or the ways of God or even the people of God, let's turn from it. One of the watchwords of the Welsh revival was, we must repent of anything doubtful. If there's any doubt about it, don't do it. That's not God's way. The Holy Spirit will actually convict us of that. If our heart is attuned to the honor of God's name, when we hear something that dishonors God's name, we won't judge that person, but we will just desire in our own hearts, Lord, restore the honor of your name. I don't believe that the name of the Lord needs to be used as an expression of surprise or shock or disappointment. Can I say that again? I don't see why the name of the Lord, this holy name, needs to be used as an expression of surprise or shock or disappointment. When Job experienced the worst things that could ever happen to a human being, think of all your worst fears, Job had all of them happen on the same day. We had a lightning strike at East Lake. I know some of our members were there. I was there on Thursday. I was going to go with Sarah Saturday. You never know what you've been spared, do you? But there's a lightning strike. Imagine Job, it was like he had multiple lightning strikes on the same day in his life. So what did he say? Did he go to Facebook and type in, OMG? No, he was operating on another level to that, wasn't he? Um, he goes, the Lord has given. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, you can only do that on your worst day if all the other days you've been living for the honor of God. And because Job was a righteous man, when the worst thing happened to him, what spilled out of him was not immature expressions of surprise or shock or disappointment or complaint, but what spilled out of him was, blessed be the name of the Lord. Can you give him praise? Let's always be ready. Perhaps it's important for us to be prepared for difficult days because the world is watching to see whether we will honor the name of the Lord or dishonor his name. So let us not use the name of God flippantly and please allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart because there may be some decisions being made right now whereby we say, I'm never ever gonna use that expression. I'm never ever gonna use the name of God or Jesus in any way that denigrates his name that minimizes his name, that makes it seem like his name is nothing, just like another phrase. I wonder whether we need to make that decision today. Say amen if you agree. Now, we can cry out to God. Jesus did cry out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did cry out, but let me tell you something. You will never be God forsaken as Jesus was at that point because he's the only man in history who lived a sinless life, hung on the cross, and the sins of the world were placed upon him. So you're never going to be in that situation of being God forsaken. You never have to say, God, why have you forsaken me? Because in Jesus Christ, because he was forsaken, God will always be with you. Now we will have hard days. And I look around this place and know how many hard days many of you have been through. There will be difficult times in our life. Therefore, it's our Christian duty to be ready for those hard times and not to use expressions that make people think that God has abandoned us because he has not. He's actually come for us and died for us and demonstrated that God-forsaken love. And by the way, he rose again from the dead. Having taken the sins of the world, Jesus Christ lives and is in glory. Glory is always ahead for those that suffer in the name of Jesus. So using God's name disrespectfully, it's really about our heart, isn't it? And so may our words give God glory. Hey, church, can I just ask if you're a New Hope member? Hold to that high standard at all times, please. Social media, conversation, Shock, surprise, disappointing moments. And if we fail, we go, Lord, forgive me. Like Isaiah, I'm a man of unclean lips. Lord, wash my lips. We have to do that all the time, don't we? I do, and I'm sure you do as well. Cleanse my lips, Lord. Cleanse my heart. Secondly, using God's name to get our way. I believe this commandment is connected to that idea that somehow we use the name of God, Jesus himself, when he kind of gave his commentary on the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. He takes everything to the next level, but you remember Jesus talks about oaths. You think, why was 
taking oaths, why was swearing a big deal? Because people were using the name of God to kind of say, I'm going to use the name of God. I'm going to use the, the fish on my uh, bumper. I'm, I'm going to use the fish on my business card. I'm going to use the name of God kind of to get my own way and to make people think that I'm being sincere because I use the name of God and I, I, I use spiritual words. In Acts chapter 19, let's turn there, shall we? We had a short reading today, so we can handle another turn of the page, amen? Acts 19. While we're turning there, it's great to see my friends Kelvin and Wynema, my neighbors who've moved away to Florida, and, and it looks like they're back in Georgia now, here to stay forever. Is that an amen, or are you just visiting? <laughs> let's welcome back my dear friends. I love these guys. Some Jews went around, Acts 19.13, some Jews went around driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. They tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. This sounds like a problem already, doesn't it? They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. I mean, they'd heard Paul do this, so they thought, well, even though our heart is not right, even though we're not sincere believers, if we use a particular phrase, that there will be power in that phrase, and obviously as Christians, we don't believe that. We believe that if we declare something in the name of Jesus, that's the very heart and soul of who we are being declared. And so they were saying, in the name of Paul, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out, seven sons of Sceva, or Sceva, a Jewish chief, chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they all ran out of the house naked and bleeding. We don't use the name of Jesus. We don't use the name of God to get our own way. We don't use the fish sign to get business. We don't use church membership to climb socially. We don't use church for politics. We must be careful not to abuse the name of God. Thirdly, insincere praise. The Pharisees thought they would be heard with their many words. They thought they would be heard with their great eloquence. Do you know how long the longest prayer in the Bible is? Six minutes. Hey, I've heard some people pray so long in the prayer meeting that the Holy Spirit has long left the building and they're still going on. And then brother so-and-so starts to give his political opinion in the prayer meeting. I don't know how his other brother of another perspective can possibly say amen to that. And so insincere praise, insincere words. Fourthly, speaking words that are not fitting to our life. I tell you what, I won't ask you to turn to Ecclesiastes. That's a little harder to find, isn't it? But let me just speak this one verse out. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. And so I encourage you, for your baptismal vow, be faithful to your baptism. If you've had parent dedication, you've committed your children, be faithful to your vow. Be faithful to your marriage vow. Don't say, um, we weren't the same people. That's utter rubbish. There were, there were witnesses to say that you are those people and that you made a declaration for better, for worse, and sickness and health to the end of your life, to be faithful to them, not to have wandering thoughts, not to do pornography, not to fall into sin, not to hate each other, to forgive each other. The, 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 the covenant was laid out clearly. So don't start coming up with stuff to say, I wasn't the same person. When you make a vow, fulfill it, amen? Do not delay in fulfilling it. Don't try and get out of the vow, say it was a mistake. Speaking words not fitting to our life. What are the words that are fitting to our life? Well, of course, to, to share Jesus Christ and to give God praise. That's a great use of our airtime, isn't it, everyone? Say yes, Reese, if you agree. I love this story. Um, Paul and Silas have been, be uh, they've been preaching, and the crowd start getting agitated because they didn't like the message. They were being jostled. They were stripped and beaten severely with rods. They were thrown into jail. The jailer had them put in the highest security part of the jail. Their feet are in stocks. They're chained and bound. Their wounds have not been treated. It's dark and scary. Probably the rats are running over them. And they're hungry. They can sometimes hear the nasty laughter of the jailer far away in, in the dungeon. And they hear the groans of the other prisoners. I suppose like Job, they could have been tempted at that point to say, woe is me, 
Isn't it all gone wrong? But because their hearts have been filled with Jesus, because they truly were proclaiming Christ as the resurrection and the life in their own heart, when the bad stuff happens, what is it that spills out of their mouth? They didn't start going on Facebook saying, oh, please pray for us, please send us cake, please send us you know, all the things that we need. They didn't start complaining, but they start what, everyone? They started praising. They started praising in the jail. That's a challenge to me. Would I first think about praising? I think most of us would want to call our lawyer, first of all. But they start praising God, praising God, and they're, they're actually singing. They're declaring from their lips what's in their hearts. Jesus Christ is Lord, and they're singing the songs of the time, probably singing even the Psalms. What happens next? God replies. There's an earthquake. <laughs> and their chains come off, and the doors swing open. In no time, the jailer is repenting of his sins, asking for mercy, and then he's getting baptized, his family's getting baptized, they're washing the wounds of Paul and Silas, they're becoming Christian community. I don't know what happened to the other prisoners, but surely they were powerfully affected by this. Praise makes a difference. My people praise God. And I think that's often the challenge, isn't it? That we get disappointment, we get surprise, we get pain, we get grief, and we stay there. And, and instead of learning from Joel, Job, instead of learning from Paul and Silas, we get stuck in those words that spill out and not what we need, amen? Instead, they praise the name of the Lord. Everybody say praise. praise. Say praise. praise. Say praise. praise. Now, who likes college football? Come on, I know y'all. Who likes college football? Don... You've got to be honest with me. Maybe not at the moment, but college football can be a little bit of fun. And sometimes we get excited and sometimes we get disappointed. We have these cheerleaders and we, uh, we, you know, we throw them in the air and hopefully we catch them at the end as well. But you know, people get very excited by college football and we try and join in with the fun um, from time to time. But you, you've heard this applied so, so many times. How come we do get so enthusiastic about Friday night football, cheering for our kids, volleyball? I've been there with your sisters. I mean, sisters, you can really cheer when it comes to the volleyball. I know uh, Al wouldn't even sit next to Shelly, and I wouldn't sit next to Louise. They make so much noise cheering for their children when they're playing volleyball. Is anybody here this morning, by the way? Is, is, are you, am I living in the same world? I, I, think this is, uh, I think this is who we are. You know that we can get very, I've never heard any other um, person on this earth than, than the American woman going, woo hoo hoo. No one else can say it like you American ladies. Get it, woo hoo hoo, you're cheering and everything. And then John Huff stands up and he's like, can we praise God? You know, are you ready to praise the Lord? And it's like we, we lose all our inhibitions at Mercedes Benz Stadium. And uh, maybe all our inhibitions at camp, we're praising God. Maybe we know there's something about being in God's house in our home place that requires honesty. And maybe if we're not living for Jesus those six days of the week, it's quite acceptable to come along and just kind of hope we get through the next hour and a quarter. But um, to honor the name of the Lord requires a little bit of energy, a little bit of input, a little bit of preparation. So we come prayed up, we come clean, we come ready to praise him, then to bring God our offering, to express God our love and adoration. We're called to be a worshiping church. You know, you're not called to be on the panel of American Idol, sat along with Simon Cowell and saying, I like this song, that was a bad song choice, that was a good song choice. Mr. Bray, our dear brother, one of the greatest men in our church history, once said to me, I don't care if you bang together a couple of rocks, I'm going to praise the Lord. Yeah? And so it's a matter of the heart. Now, John, I think you do better than banging a couple of rocks together this morning. That was pretty awesome today. But when you live in a prison cell, there's no sheet music, there's no band, but you're praising him anyway. You don't have the luxury of saying, I'm not in the mood any longer. You just praise the name of the Lord. Praise him in the morning, praise him in the evening, praise him when I'm young, praise him when I'm old. Now, there's a certain order that is required. There's a tension between passion and order that's needed in the church. As a pastor of the last 30 odd years, I've seen a few fun things, crazy things over the years. Like there was the brother, I'm going back some time. In fact, I've been here long enough to say, when I first came to this church, 
You know, I used to just tell the stories of, of, uh, of the past. When I first, now I can remember there was the brother, and if the church stood, he would sit. And, and if the church sat down, he would stand. And if the church was standing, half, half standing, half standing, he would prostrate himself before the Lord. And if the church was lifting his hands, he wouldn't lift his hands. But if no one's lifting hands, he would want to lift his hands to the Lord. Because you know what? He was drawing attention to himself. And it takes spiritual discernment. It doesn't, you have, don't have to be a genius to usually spot that from time to time. Then there was the wafting lady. We call her the wafting lady in my former church. And uh, I don't know what it was. And I mentioned this. Megan was at our south campus and she was, she remembered this lady. But she would waft all the way during the service. All the way through all the songs, she was wafting something in. We don't know what she was wafting, but she was the wafting lady. She did, did this for about three years. She probably lost about 30 pounds doing it, actually, while she was doing it. Maybe it was some kind of exercise beach body thing or something that she was doing there. And so occasionally there's, then there's cell phones. Do you remember the days when cell phones used to go off in church? And by the way, young people's cell phones never, let's give it up for the young folks, they're really smart and savvy. When now when a cell phone goes off in any public place in America, if someone's cell phone goes off, it's always an old person. I'm not saying how old is. And, uh, and uh, because most senior adults are now younger than Elvis Presley, I know most of you, you're all a bunch of old rockers, and so you think it might be like Beethoven's fifth, you know, da 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 da, might go off. No, 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 it's almost like, ah, 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 ah. It's like, is that like jumping Jack Flash by the Rolling Stones? And it's always really loud, ah, ah, and they can never find it, can they? It's like, ah. Uh, anyway, but, so I just said when I, when I first get, got here, guys, if our phone goes off in church, it's $100 to the building fund. Everyone say amen. amen. And it's like, we've been great since then. I mean, like, y'all have been holding on to your $100 ever since. And so, you know, there is a certain um, order in worship. We like our kids to be well cared for during our worship time. You know, it's right for us to kind of follow the pattern that God has laid before us. But let's, let's make sure in the middle of all that, we desire more than anything else to give all the honor and all the praise and all the glory to the Lord himself. And so I, I was gonna say something about reckless words, I don't need to do that. I was gonna say something about cussing and swearing, there's a few Bible words that say, there are certain words, we, if there's any doubt, just eliminate it from your vocabulary. And even some of the replacement words, can I just say this, even some of the replacement words of the words you definitely shouldn't use, I think we need to be careful about that because the spirit of negativity, the spirit of the swear, cuss word, still can be heard even from your replacement word if your heart is not right. Give me an amen if you know that's true. So we need to make some decisions about that. Some of us need to retrain ourselves, but the best way of being retrained is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be right with the Lord. But I do wanna close with this thought about our words and about the honor of God's name. And that is Jesus himself gave us a special name Paul referred to it in 1 Corinthians, we are the body of Christ. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. So we are every bit and maybe even more holy than the Ark of the Covenant or the tabernacle or the temple in which the Ark of the Covenant went. We are the new covenant and so therefore we are every bit as holy. And so when the oxen stumble and we reach out and we touch the body of Christ, we need to realize that the people of God are very special. Everyone say special. In fact, hands up if you know that the body of Christ is a holy thing. Hands up in the air if you know the body of Christ is a holy thing. Can you consider this, friends, that sometimes when we've spoken against, people will say, I don't like the church. The church, the church is God's word. That's God's word. When, when we, I don't know who this the church is. Would you mean the global church? Do you mean every church in the world? Do you mean the American church? Do you mean every church in America? So sometimes people just use these blank phrases, not really thinking about it. And if we talk about a specific church, even New Hope, or, or, or another church, the church that we don't go to, we need to speak well of each other. We need to realize that we're not in competition with each other. And in fact, the quicker we can eliminate the competition and be on the same side, the more is going to be accomplished in Jesus' name, amen. But I wonder whether sometimes we've actually sinned against the body and blood of Jesus by sinning against the people of God. Galatians 5, verse 15. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you may be destroyed by one another. 